when a murder is discovered. And what you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase which has been deposited on a railway embankment covered over by twigs and other foliage. It doesn't just destroy one life. And then you find out what really happened. You read it in books, you see it in TV shows and everything else. It's really tough. Well, there isn't a day go by that you don't remember something. It tears communities apart. You can still speak to residents now, and they say they've never got over it or what happened to a young man in the midst of their little community here. It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery. That was our hope, that where we were going was going to provide us with a treasure chest of information. And track down the killer, but bring them to justice. I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody do such a terrible thing? On today's program, a 27-year-old recluse is accused of killing his mother. It was a nightmare. We had been living in a nightmare. He was also said to be incredibly intelligent, but definitely he was socially awkward, and a lot of people thought he was weird. While his father was missing. The whole bathroom was covered in newspapers. They were soaked with what appeared to be blood. Meet the murder detectives. The first thing I noticed when I went in, I glanced up and saw the lines of blood splashes across the ceiling. Who reveal how they caught the killer. I realized that we had maybe one murder and maybe two on our hands. In 1981 in Hedge End, near Southampton in Hampshire, a 60-year-old woman was missing. Her friend, a doctor, felt something was very wrong and called the police. He was really worried about this lady, and he was genuine. My first impressions were that this was not just a missing person. It's something had happened to this lady. DCI Mike Southwell from Hampshire Police took on the case. The woman was identified as 60-year-old Leah Rosenthal. Local journalist Richard Slee has reported on dozens of missing persons cases, but this one was different. This was a really unusual case because Leah was not your typical subject. She wasn't a teenager who'd had a fight with her family. This was a mature woman. Why on earth would she go missing all of a sudden? Leah was visiting her son Daniel in Hedge End. Mike Southwell was used to cases like this not ending well. I've been on about 14 murders, either as the SIO or on one of the squads. All different sorts. In the town of Hedge End, Detective Constable Cliff Ball joined the investigation. There's nothing ultra special, ultra crime ridden about it or anything. It's a normal environment. The bittern and Hedge End has changed enormously since the time that we were talking about, 1980-81. It was just one small village of Upper Northern Road. But now it's one of the highest populated places in, in Hampshire. Leah Rosenthal had last been seen at her son Daniel's bungalow. Today, it's owned by Janet and Frank. It's quiet, very nice. Peaceful? Yes, yeah. yes very peaceful. Nice neighbours. As is usual in a missing person case, Mike began by tracing Leah's last movements. The man who had reported her missing had spoken to her the previous day. She told him that she had had a strange phone call from the authorities in Paris stating that her husband had gone missing. Leah and Milton Rosenthal were separated and they were living independently. It's thought they disagreed over how to bring up their son Daniel and this contributed to their breakup. But they were a close couple and they kept in regular contact. 
Milton Rosenthal lived in Paris. The doctor told Mike that Leah had made arrangements with him to go over to France to look for her husband, but she never called back. The doctor hadn't heard from her for two days, even though they'd made plans. The next day, he tried to call her at her son Daniel's house. He tried all morning, and there was no answer. The following morning, quite early, he rang the number again, and this time, Daniel answered the phone. And he merely said, my mother has returned to London and put the phone down. He phoned back several times afterwards, but on each occasion, the receiver was lifted and then replaced. Both Mike and the doctor thought Daniel's behavior was strange and feared he had something to do with his mother's disappearance. It would have been fairly routine to consider the family in the first instance. You always start with the most obvious individuals with the closest connection to the suspect, and then you can, you know, kind of begin to rule them out fairly quickly um, by, you know, their uh, movements around the time when the person went missing. Mike also learned Leah had severe multiple sclerosis that affected her mobility. She was in her 60s, and she could only walk with two crutches. And I got the impression that the doctor was fearing for this lady's life. Mike sent a unit round to Leah's son's house, where she was last seen. He also began looking into her husband's disappearance and phoned his apartment in Paris. To my surprise, a young lady answered, who turned out to be uh, an American. When she learned that she was speaking to a British police officer, she broke down in tears. Uh, she could hardly speak, but I managed to get from her, Daniel's killed his father. A simple missing person call had rapidly turned into a suspected murder. But with no body, Mike sent a team to Daniel's house in Hedge End to talk to him. We are now coming in the road where this happened. And here is a bungalow. I must say it looks much, much smarter than the time that I saw it all those years ago. Philippa Painter was Daniel Rosenthal's next door neighbor. He was a very, very quiet, personal man who kept himself to himself. I found him odd, but to be quite honest, I felt he was nuts, mad. I only met his mother once, not long after they bought the bungalow. The last time we saw her, she was sort of struggling down the slope. After that, we never saw her. Les Cullen, who lives across the road, also saw Leah arrive at the house. We watched her being helped from the taxi down the, down the slope to the bungalow. He made a distinct effort to stay out of her sight. And she was not at all welcome when, he, when she got into the house. And we never saw her again. Nobody had seen Leah Rosenthal for days. Mike's suspicions grew. My thoughts at that point is, Mrs. Rosenthal is dead. When that happens in a case, everything changes. You put out all the stops. In the Rosenthal case, one of the challenges there is that you haven't got a body and there's complicated decisions around actually when do you decide that a missing person case is elevated to a murder investigation because of course you can't be so certain if there isn't a body. With a team already on the ground, Mike radioed through to his detective sergeant and told him to arrest Daniel on suspicion of causing serious harm to his mother. I said, bring him to Eastleigh Police Station where you and I will interview him. Mike also ordered a search of Daniel's bungalow. It was a weird feeling. You have the feeling that there was something terribly wrong 
uh, with this place. The place was oh, disgraceful. There is nothing but dirt and filth everywhere. The search for Leah Rosenthal was now a murder investigation. Leah Rosenthal had gone missing from her son Daniel's home in Hedge End, Hampshire, in August 1981. After two days, police were fearing the worst and had begun questioning Daniel and were searching his home for evidence of murder. Part of the house he turned into a workshop. He was doing experiments on chicken with their heads distasteful as this might be, he was trying apparently to create super chicken. Most of the bungalow that Daniel lived in was filthy and covered in bags, files, books, etc. It must have been a hell of a stink in that bungalow. But one room was completely empty and the police reported that, that it looked like it had been scrubbed with wire wool. Now imagine that to the police was highly suspicious. In the front room there, they, he had it buried in the, under the floor and out in the garden, eggs all the one way up um, to try to produce his, this uh, chicken. He actually kept chickens in the front, front room. room. Yeah. As you went through the house at that time, uh, one has never seen anything like it before. There was newspapers piled high, there was tools, a lathe in the dining room, and every room had rubbish all over the floor. Mike could see evidence that 60-year-old Leah Rosenthal had been visiting her son from Israel and was supposed to be staying with him for several days. His mother's case is there and it's open, but it doesn't look as if she slept on the single bed where the case is. Daniel was taken to Eastleigh Police Station. As police searched his home, they found no sign of his mother, but what they were discovering was raising suspicions. It seems a crime detective sergeant phoned me and he said, Gov, we found a hacksaw. It looks to me as if it's been washed because when he picked it up with rubber gloves on, some water dripped from the hollow handle. The hacksaw was sent off to be examined and samples of stains found on the floor were also analyzed. Daniel had been in custody for nearly 48 hours, but without a body or forensic evidence, Mike didn't have enough to charge him. Back in 1980, you could bring somebody into the police station, but not necessarily as a prisoner, so you could invite them back in as a witness and sit and talk to them for some considerable time. Daniel was taken into custody and officers started door-to-door -door inquiries. Knock on the back door and uh, there was a policeman stood there and um, he said, do you know anything about the neighbour next door? So I, I told him a few odds and ends that I did know. I mean, never really been in conversation with him. And um, he said, have you seen his mother? So I said, well, not for quite some time. The last time we saw her, she was walking very gingerly down the driveway. Neighbours Philippa and Les revealed more about Daniel's unusual behaviour. I used to see him out in his garden and he'd just be laying flat on the grass. Um, all the grass was long, but he'd be laid there face down, flat on the grass. Um, he could be there for a couple of hours. Middle of the night, you would suddenly hear, wee, bang. He'd be letting off fireworks on his back patio. And I was bothered by it because I thought, well, you know, if he can make fireworks, um, he could do anything. You know, I, I worried for the family's safety. He never mixed with anybody, he never spoke to anybody. He was purely and simply a loner. He used to walk around with his head down on his chest. 
Never looked up. Never. While Daniel's bungalow was being searched for evidence of his mother, Mike returned to the accusation that Daniel had killed his father, Milton, in Paris. He called the American housekeeper back. She told him she had been doing Milton's ironing when she last saw Daniel. She said the ironing took her about an hour and 40 minutes. And the whole of that time, she said, I think the sink and the bath and maybe the shower was all on at one time. I could hear it. He came out of the bathroom and she said, he, he looked at me in a strange way. And he stared at me and he said, I want you to go now. And she was frightened and she left. That night, the housekeeper heard Daniel drive away and the following morning, she went back into the flat. The whole bathroom was covered in newspapers, old cloths, old clothes, and they were soaked with what appeared to be blood. And so she reported it to the police. Mike knew he would have to visit Paris to investigate Daniel's father's disappearance. But first, he came face to face with the suspect himself. Daniel was dirty. He smelt. He looked as if he hadn't washed for months. He was fidgety, uncomfortable. And as soon as we started speaking to him, I realized that we had maybe one murder and maybe two on our hands. Daniel's bungalow had been sealed off as a crime scene and forensics were meticulously going through the contents. Mike asked Daniel about his strangely empty room. He said it was in such a mess I had to clean it. He does experiments with chickens. He's got a polythene framed laboratory in what would be his lounge. And he works on 280, I think he said, 280 chicks. As Mike learned more about Daniel, it became clear he had not had an ordinary life. He had been taken to a psychiatrist by his mother, Leah, when he was just eight years old. The psychiatrist apparently told his mother that he was a genius. And unfortunately, for everyone concerned, I think that uh, he was uh, believing that he was a genius himself. From that point on, he was homeschooled. He had no contact with other children at all. So not only does telling him he's this genius, this special child, almost create the you know, delusions of grandeur, potentially creates narcissistic personality, that I'm the chosen one, I'm special. But he also then begins to live a very isolated lifestyle. Mike hoped that by engaging Daniel in conversation, he might slip up and reveal something. But this was no ordinary interview. He had a habit of pausing, pausing between question and answer. And at times, these pauses would go on for minutes. You can imagine it was very frustrating. And I found myself over and over again saying, look at me when I'm talking to you. I cannot hear you. He had a quite unusual way of talking. It could be a symptom of paranoid schizophrenia. It could also be a symptom of his personality disorders. Also the fact that this is a man who doesn't know how to sit down and have that natural interaction. The art to interviewing isn't necessarily about getting somebody to confess. It's about being able to put across all the information and get a response from them. Back in the 1980s, it was a very different era. But now there's a greater understanding of the psychology of interviewing and the way that people respond to interviews. To the outside world, 
Daniel's life was more than a little unusual. He'd never worked, didn't have any friends, and he was financially dependent on his parents. He was also said by some to be incredibly intelligent, but definitely he was socially awkward and a lot of people thought he was weird. His explanation for his mother's disappearance was simply that she'd gone back to London. He said she'd taken a taxi to Southampton Station. This claim was thoroughly investigated by Mike and the team. We did every taxi firm in Southampton and every private hire firm. But not one firm had a record of picking up Leah Rosenthal on the day she disappeared. Daniel's story fell apart. I didn't feel frustrated because I was convinced that we would charge him. But we needed more evidence. The only solid evidence Mike had was the wet hacksaw blade. Finally, after 72 hours without any forensics, the initial findings came back. A small fragment of tissue believed to be soft tissue was found on a hacksaw belonging to Daniel Rosenthal. This soft tissue was then analysed, or the blood was analysed, enabling the investigators to determine a blood group profile, that which matched Leah Rosenthal. The blood on the hacksaw may have matched Leah's blood type, but 11.5% of the population were also a match. It didn't prove murder. In Hedge End, Hampshire, senior investigating officer Mike Southwell believed Leah Rosenthal had been murdered by her son, but he had no concrete proof. His team on the ground were searching for any proof Leah was in fact dead. Daniel's neighbours had noticed something unusual about his bungalow. It was during the summer, sort of spring, summer time, when the weather was getting warmer. We used to get some horrible smells. We couldn't work out what the smell was, so we looked over the wall and we saw there was a couple of black sacks tied up and uh, we sort of decided that's where the stench was coming. This wasn't the only story the neighbours had about Daniel's strange behaviour with rubbish. One morning, the dustmen were coming along the road and he began to follow the wagon up the road. And I did say to my wife, come and look at, we called him Fruit and Nut. Come and look at Fruit and Nut, he's following the dust wagon up the road where you're accusing somebody of murder and you haven't got a body is really, really challenging because actually that individual, all they've got to do is sit back and say, prove it. Mike was convinced that Daniel had killed his mother and was gathering evidence. Tests on blood found between tiles in the empty room showed it was the same blood type as Leah's. So we had a pretty good idea that that is where he cut his mother up. In the lab, the small fragments of flesh found on the hacksaw were being examined. If the origin of that tissue is somewhere so deep within the body that that individual could not possibly survive without, then it may indicate that the individual is in fact deceased. While the team waited with bated breath for those forensic results, Mike continued to interview Daniel about the only thing he was happy to talk about, his chicken experiments. We know that Daniel experimented on the brains and embryos of chickens. When he was interviewed, he said he chopped the heads off the chickens initially, but he had to stop doing that because then they would run around afterwards with no head, which would have been a bizarre sight. So he said he now injected these chickens with poison, but he never said why he did these experiments, only that when he got these results back, whenever that would be, he says he would be world famous. I think this is an aspect of his delusions, his delusional thinking. He could have been being told to, to do these experiments and it's, it's a delusion and a sign that the man was very, very unwell. In addition, we do see that cruelty to animals is something that's correlated to quite extreme violence. He told me how he got rid of the remains of the chickens, that he put them 
in these plastic bags. He said the dustmen come round once a fortnight for the black bags and they give me permission to throw it in the back. My immediate reaction to him was, what has he done with his mother's body? Mike asked Daniel where he bought his black bin bags. Daniel revealed it was a shop called Wise Buys in Bitter. We made inquiries at Wise Buys, and of course, uh, the couple who ran the shop did not know Daniel, and so it didn't happen. It didn't help at all. It was a dead end, but every lead had to be investigated, and Mike was nearly out of time. I knew that the fourth day was going to be the last day. Uh, we would either have enough to charge him or we would have to release him on bail. The breakthrough came on the last day, uh, just after lunchtime. Mike got a call from the forensic pathologist who had been examining the tissue found on the hacksaw. This tissue was from so deep a part of the human body that unless that human being was on an operating table, then that person must be dead. That's all I needed um, to prove that she was dead. 27-year-old Daniel was charged with the murder of his mother, Leah, even though her body had not been found. The press got hold of it the moment that we had charged him. This was such a good story because it had all the key ingredients. Sympathetic, innocent victim, mad scientist suspect, and this weird setting of the bungalow. The chicken experiments, the chicken wire, the headless chicken stories. The fact that Leah's body has not been found also gives it an edge of mystery. Daniel's neighbor, Philippa, was deeply affected by the news. Absolute panic, fear, I went to my doctor and asked to be put into Knoll Hospital because I thought I was going to go mad. It was a nightmare. We had been living in a nightmare. Now Daniel had been charged with Leah's murder, Mike had travelled to France to investigate the disappearance of his father, Milton, from his home in Paris. I was hoping to find evidence of a like offence. If Mike could find evidence that Daniel had killed his father in his home, this could be admissible in court and help convict Daniel of his mother's murder. Detective Sergeant Cliff Bull was a scene of crime officer and spoke French, so joined Mike at Milton's flat. Well, it takes a lot to shock a scenes of crime officer because it's the nature of your job. It's an immunity which is more or less built in, I feel. The French police had sealed off the flat, but hadn't found any evidence relating to Milton's disappearance. We entered the apartment. Uh, Cliff, the scene's a crime officer, was looking out around the hallway. It wasn't the tidiest place I've ever been into, by any manner of means. But the first thing I noticed when I went in, I glanced up and saw the lines of blood splashes across the ceiling and this is what first gave me my suspicions that something dreadful had happened in this flat. The detectives were beginning to paint a picture of what may have happened in this room. Milton Rosenthal had been sitting at his table using his typewriter when he was attacked from behind with a hammer with several blows to the head. And so the blows to the head, the first one would damage the head and the subsequent ones would pick up blood on the hammer and pick it up and put it up on the ceiling in, in splashes of blood which were directional. Cliff surveyed the area around the blood spatter. There was a room separator made up of shelves between the dining area and the kitchen. These shelves were behind the table where Milton Rosatella had been sitting when he was on his typewriter. And 
the hammer swinging back had knocked a chunk of wood out of one of the shelves. And in the, in the damage to the shelf was apparent blood and some human hair. The French police had only been investigating Milton's disappearance as a missing person. The challenge of any investigation is understanding the, the, the mindset of the investigators. So if the Parisian police had gone round to the flat on the basis that it was a missing person and they just looked and the door was locked and there was no damage to the windows, etc., they would have just viewed it as a missing person. And that wouldn't have meant that they took as an in-depth examination of the flat. Mike and Cliff believed Daniel Rosenthal had killed his mother. Now they had reason to believe they could prove he had done the same to his father. I looked into a small room off the dining area, which was a complete mess. It was a, a room full of junk, in fact. And inside the doorway was a, a box or a bin, resting on the top of which was a hacksaw. I obviously took possession of the hacksaw, which was absolutely clogged with human matter. Milton's apartment was beginning to look a lot like the crime scene in Hedge End, where human remains had already been discovered, and the evidence in Paris kept presenting itself. I then looked into the bathroom. I found a tiny piece of bone still on the floor, and there were smudge marks on the bath panel as if a hand had been swung across the bath panel from inside the bath. The blood, hair and bone indicated Milton had been killed. Mike had his evidence of a like offence. I felt relief, complete relief. The British team were surprised the French authorities had not come to the same conclusions as they had. There's someone uh, had obviously got it wrong uh, and didn't look far enough and certainly didn't listen. The housekeeper was a crucial witness who could testify to Daniel's behaviour. But Mike and his team couldn't charge Daniel with his father's murder as it was on French soil. Mike returned to the UK and started a massive search for Leah's body. Of course, when you don't find it, there's always a hope that perhaps they're still alive. So it gives momentum, you just carry on. Draining lakes, stopping all the incinerators in Hampshire. 100 police officers and about 100 council volunteers searched these places when it was possible to search, until there was nowhere else to search. As they looked for a body, more stories emerged about Daniel's behavior. His neighbor, Philippa's memories, took on a new meaning. One day, my mum was sat sort of in this position, eye lined straight through, and uh, Daniel had come from the shop. She looked out the window, she said, oh, Nipper's trotting down the driveway, he's bought himself a hacksaw, which was this little, little thing with a small blade. Never thought any more of it. And of course it was when the police, after a few days after the police had come and told us what had happened, it looks like that was how he disposed of things. Mike also began to connect Leah's disappearance with the day Milton was reported missing in Paris. I believe that uh, when his mother arrived, that there was this phone call that the police officers told her that her estranged husband was missing. And I suspect that when that happened, Daniel was in the same room. And I can imagine that elderly lady saying, Daniel, what have you done? And I believe that that is where he killed her. Mike and the team may have been convinced of Daniel's guilt, but there had never been a murder conviction without a body. Mike needed the evidence he had found in France to be allowed to be used in court, or Daniel Rosenthal could walk free.
In the summer of 1981, a quiet area of Southampton had been rocked by the arrest of Daniel Rosenthal for the murder of his mother Leah. Police also believed he had murdered his father Milton in Paris. How you could bludgeon your father to death when he's sitting at a typewriter typing, how could you possibly do this? It's an abnormal thing to do. Mike presented the evidence found at Daniel's father's flat. The blood, the hair, the bone, to a judge who could decide if Mike could use it in court to help prove that Daniel had killed his mother. You've always got in the back of your mind, this could all go wrong. You'll get a jury that it needs one, two intelligent people for people who are not sure to turn that verdict around. Just two weeks before Daniel went to trial, Mike and the team got some extraordinary news from France. A farmer was clearing up his fields, which is next to a railway line. you look at soft tissue analysis, you may be able to look at age estimation from some of the bones, including the ribs and the long bones. The site was 80 miles from Daniel's father Milton's home. And that wasn't all. On two of the black bags, there is a small, sticky, yellow price ticket. And it says, wise buyers, bitter the very same shop where Daniel had said he bought his black bags. I knew that that would be the finishing touch and I was given leave to bring that evidence in as a like offence, which proved in fact that he probably did exactly the same thing with his mother. But first, the remains found in France had to be identified. The most important thing, of course, was the parts of this body, which they could show was the exact size and the same blood group as Milton. The French authorities examined the cut marks on the bones against the hacksaw found in Milton's apartment. The information from cut marks on bones is commonly used when compared to a reference database. So we'll be able to compare the striations that the hacksaw is known to create on bone, compare this to evidence seen in the case. They were able to match the bones that they had up against the hacksaw that we found. We didn't find all of Milton Rosenthal. It will never be found. I mean, it could be anywhere. Think of anywhere you could put. How many pieces are you going to dismember a body into to make it portable? Legs, arms, head, chest, abdomen. You think to yourself, my goodness me, what sort of person could do this? Not a normal person at all. On the 16th of June 1982, Daniel Rosenthal went to court in Winchester, charged with the murder of his mother Leah. To everyone's surprise, rather than plead diminished responsibility, 
Daniel pleaded not guilty. On all the evidence of his behaviour and background, he could have easily pleaded insanity. The evidence was presented against Daniel. The hacksaw, the blood between the tiles, his father's flat, and finally, the black bags containing Milton's body with the Wise Buys label. I watched Daniel very closely when that evidence was given and his face changed for the first time. Against the advice of his defence counsel, Daniel insisted on giving evidence in court. He would speak with his head bowed and he would be speaking to the ground, answering whatever you asked of him. He would never look you directly in the face and he spent a lot of time deliberating on his answers. He told them that his father had been followed for years and so had he by the American CIA. And it was quite obvious to him that they had assassinated his father. After Daniel's evidence, the judge did his summing up and instructed the jury they should not return for at least two hours. But they sent a message that they had completed their deliberations in an hour and five minutes and wanted to come back. The foreman said that they had come to a unanimous decision and he allowed them to give that verdict and that verdict was unanimous guilty. In his sentencing, the judge referenced Daniel's not guilty plea. He said, no one has come into my court to tell me that you are insane or that you have any mental problems whatsoever. And I can therefore only come to one conclusion, and that is that you are just plain evil. And I sentence you to life. From a forensic point of view, perhaps the most fascinating aspect of this landmark case is that a conviction was achieved without the presence of a body, and this was the first time that this had ever happened. The media went to town on the story, as double murderer Daniel Rosenthal was put away. He was sent to Ashworth Hospital, which is a high security facility for highly violent prisoners with psychiatric needs. I'm surprised he had the ability to do it but I'm not surprised that it did happen. I was told that he was um, a very brilliant man. It didn't come across like that to me. I was frightened of him. And the bizarre story of Daniel Rosenthal didn't end there. He was later transferred to Tatchbury Mount, which is a lower security unit, and in 2013, he escaped. The police came knocking one day and said that Daniel had escaped and not worried about you, we're worried about him. We think he might come round. Two o'clock in the morning, Two o'clock in the morning. They came round again and they hadn't caught him. So they were giving us things to keep the doors closed. Daniel was caught the following day and returned to his secure unit, where he will stay for the rest of his sentence. This is a macabre case of matricide and patricide. The killing of one's mother, the killing of one's father. I can't think of anything worse that a man would find a reason to kill his parents.